We're going to start the, uh, the next session, which is the Emerging CMT Panel. This is going to be the, the, the first kind of flagship launch of this. We're going to do this every year henceforth uh, in a two-day uh, symposium like this. And I think really the best way to kind of kick it off is just to get a sense for the crowd. This won't necessarily be a pure sample because it's not reflective of the entire membership. But if you're a CMT holder, could you please stand? I just want to get a feeling for how many CMTs we actually have in the room. So if you're not a CMT, and you're in the program, there are those who have decades, in some instances, more experience than some, than some of these individuals, and some of those uh, folks are here in the room today that are actually going through the program as they start. But the individuals who started this program um, really created a, uh, an environment for the rest of us to excel. And just by show of hands, from an emerging, uh, emerging standpoint, how many people here have in have had your CMT for less than five years, such as myself. Now, of those, how many of those have had theirs for less than two years? So that's a pretty good crowd. So of the, of the five-year, two-year mix, I mean, there's a pretty good number of folks. And Tom gave you the dynamics of how that uh, growth is happening. And the three individuals we're going to talk about today have a variety of experiences. And uh, they're going to be joined uh, by uh, a surprise uh, guest uh, here as we roll forth. But I introduce the, the three folks that we're going to uh, uh, have a conversation with uh, here uh, going forward. The first gentleman is somebody that is a, a fellow Buckeye, so that's a big plus for him. I've got to give him a kudo for that uh, to uh, us Midwestern people that uh, come up and speak funding to the New York folks. Uh, Craig Fullen is, the, uh, is a portfolio manager with Advanced Asset Management Advisors. He's also a member of the board. He's actually an officer as well. And one of the interesting things I love about Craig is that uh, – He's also an attorney, so when I need help, I can call counsel and get that done. Uh, he's uh, also um, the uh, president of the Fulham Law Group, and he is the, uh, the, the, was the president and founder of the Formica Investment Strategies. And he has a background, actually, in corporate uh, law as well, in business law, where he was doing private equity. So um, he's a really interesting guy. So please welcome Craig Fulham to, to the uh, panel today. I have a kudo for this next uh, gentleman. Uh, James Bartoloni is the president of uh, the GTA group. Um, I've known uh, Jim for many years. He was an individual that when I was uh, younger and more foolish and more uh, uh, of a challenging nature and used to fly F-14s, uh, he had, uh, I would hope at times, the honor, but probably most times, the displeasure of flying with me in the backseat of an F-14. He's a fellow Naval Academy graduate and a, uh, a, with a BS in mathematics. Uh, but before he was the president of the GTA group, he was the, the lead technician for the Wind to Trade group. Uh, big believer in intermarket analysis, and he was also uh, so good in the program that I actually recruited him to be a level three instructor uh, when I was running the, the CMT Institute. So please welcome uh, Jim Bartoloni. <laughs> and then uh, last, <laughs> if, you get to, if, you, if you get to know him more, you'll know that, that nature. Um, and then the last individual we're going to introduce today is uh, a gentleman who's become a very close friend of mine in a short amount of time. I feel like I've known him for uh, far longer than uh, our relationship reflects. But Jeremy Berkovitz is the founder of National Securities Technical Research uh, Program. He actually publishes daily research that goes out to uh, several thousand users and well over 20,000 users, and uh, some of which are uh, 1,500 that are financials in, in 45 countries around the world. He's been doing research for a number of years. He's been uh, with the MTA through uh, 2007. And um, I also consider it an honor to have been someone who worked with Jeremy through the CMT program. And I can tell you that he's uh, truly one of the uh, upcoming and uh, rising CMT. So please welcome Jeremy. So, so what we're going to do over the next few, uh, for a few moments is I, I put a few guardrails up. And the guardrails were pretty much as follows, that they've got 10 minutes and 10 slides to try to convey to you either what they're thinking, how they approach the market. And what I really hope to take away from this is that nobody in this room really has something that's either altogether their own or is approaching it exactly the same. And then there are technicians who wrote the books from which I uh, formulated my own strategies and the way that I like to uh, approach my work. And um, if you see any of those folks in the, uh, the crowd today, I, I really encourage you to get to, to know them more and thank them for some of the work that they've done on our behalf. But for the moment, what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn it over to the three uh, gentlemen that are here up on the, uh, the stage and get their thoughts about 
how did I come to know the CMT program or what do I see the CMT program for myself and what happens when I get my CMT? I, I would always tell the candidates that were going through the CMTI process, I would always tell them and say, you know, listen, when you finish the program, that's kind of like graduating from high school. And when you get your CMT, that's kind of like finishing college. That's really when the real work begins. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Craig, and we'll hear what these three gents have to say. Uh, before I get started, I have an important announcement. Um, it has just been brought to my attention that in light of the strong state of the MTA, as Tom Silveri conveyed to us, and in order to level the playing field given the stock market events of the past year, Governor Patterson has proposed that all market profits resulting from the use of fundamental analysis will be now taxed at 0%. And all market profits resulting from the use of technical analysis will now be taxed at 90%. Further, any market technician using more than two indicators on a chart will be assessed an additional excess tax of $250 per indicator. <laughs> okay, now I have received assurances from the Attorney General that he still believes that technical analysis is defined as the marriage between a market indicator and a market technician. Okay, so we're all clear there. Um, I, thought, I thought I'd get more laughs out of this stuff. <laughs> all right, I'm already bombing. Okay. So in light of that, let's, we're going to talk about uh, some taxing questions for mar market technicians. You know, what does it mean to take technical analysis to the next level? And I think what Jeff said is really pertinent. I view getting the CMT as, me as when I completed law school. You know, I had some basics. I knew some concepts. But I really didn't know how to apply them in the real world, OK? And hopefully, uh, it goes by Bart, and Jeremy and I will uh, all try to convey that to you over the next hour, OK? by discussing how we each approach the financial markets and use different types of technical analysis. So again, going back to the taxing questions, I think it's really important when you're applying technical analysis to really question your beliefs about the financial markets. You know, what I've found is there are a lot of people who use technical analysis, yet they're so worried about the news story that might come out or the earnings release that's scheduled, and they're not just looking at their indicators, right? I've seen some really brilliant people who have the best indicators that pick tops and bottoms, but they trade like conventional people and are looking, well, I've got to wait for the trend to change. Okay? Um, so really, I think, you know, what are your, my beliefs are that the market, you know, has mathematical and geometric structure. And I, for those of you who are going to be here tomorrow and hear Michael Jenkins, he's going to go probably talk a lot about that. And he's probably one of the best people you'll hear on that subject. Okay. Is your analysis consistent with those beliefs? And that's just that prior point that I made. You know, are you applying your technical analysis in a way that reflects how you view the markets? And then the bottom line is, does your analysis give you an edge? Okay? It's not okay to be an average technician, all right? Especially in the tough market environment we're in right now. Okay? If you don't have an edge, or you don't think you have an edge, you definitely don't. All right, it's kind of like that saying that if you're sitting around the poker table and you don't know who the sucker is, sucker is it's you, right? If you, if you don't know that you have an edge to apply your technical analysis, which allows you to do better or be able to have insights that others don't, then you don't have it. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about transitioning from analysis to portfolio management because I believe this is the future for market technicians. You know, a lot of people who started the MTA were analysts. Newsletter writers uh, provided research services. I think that trend is going to change. And if you look at the job postings on the MTA job board, you see it's like a hedge fund, wants a, you know, a technical analyst. It's, this is where we're going. And this is why the edge is so important, because you've got to take that technical analysis and get to the bottom line. And, th and there are only two objectives of using technical analysis. I mean, it's really simple. You're improving investment performance or you're managing investment risk. That's it. I can't think of anything else. OK. I call this part, know your tools and break the rules. I love the Yogi Berra quote, because I think what I found is there are a lot of things about indicators, you know, common indicators, common oscillators. You know, people just apply them sometimes how they, they view them in the, in the textbook or what, what they learned in the CMT program. 
If any, did anyone read Connie Brown's book, Trading or Technical Analysis for the Trading Professional? Remember she talked about the Stochastics Default Club? Okay. There are a lot of different settings you can use on indicators. Okay? There are a lot of different ways to interpret indicators that haven't been published. I know I use a lot of them, and I'm kind of reluctant to tell people about them. You know? But uh, it's, and I really think you'll learn a lot by just looking at how these indicators react in different environments. All right. I think it's critical to develop innovative approaches to interpreting indicators. Kind of goes to the, the first point. All right? Can you? Develop, I mean, can, can you integrate indicators? And the third point, integrate indicators, and they give you a different result. Um, I also think it's important to understand the thought processes of the pros. One of my favorite books is a book by, um, is not Robert Prechter's Elliott Wave book. It's a book called Prechter's Perspectives. Has anybody read that? It's a series of interviews with Mr. Prechter, and you really get into his thought process. process. And I was sitting in a investment meeting you know, a couple months ago, right you know, as the market was getting close to bottoming. And I remember one of the guys in, on my investment committee was talking about, we're all worried about what the government was going to do, are they going to raise taxes, what's going to do the economy. And I said, this is predicted in the cycle. The cycle is driving the reactions of the politicians in Washington right now. Okay? And that was a critical concept that I learned from Robert Prechter's book. Okay? Everybody thinks that this stuff's going on randomly. No, this is all part of the cycle. People are behaving in terms of the cycle. All right. Question what you have been taught. Okay. I, I'm a, you know, I, one of the things I, I, this is, and I don't mean to be critical of people who do this, but I, I'm surprised sometimes when I hear people say, you know, they're practicing CMTs and they like keep the Edwards and McGee book on their desk. I've never touched any of my main CMT books once I got past of it. Basically, everything I apply now is every, is, are things that I observe in the market and I apply them go, going forward. Okay, I try to learn new things. I do read other things, but I don't rely on the old textbooks. I think you need to keep going and moving forward to get that edge. And then break the rules and establish new ones. I'm going to show how I, I do some of that concept. Real basic. You know, you know, we don't have a lot of time today, so I'll just give you a concept of how I break the rules and establish new ones. Okay, let's go to the videotape. Or how about the charts of the S&P 500? This is just an example, very rudimentary example of how I take a couple different oscillators, I put them in a formula, and then I plot them in a chart and it automatically appears on the chart. And what I like about this is it kind of gives you forewarning of things that might happen in the market. And anytime you see these yellow lines, it's basically, are we in a transition phase in the market, okay? You know, it helps you identify that there might be a potential turning point here on the March bottom pretty well. And again, that's just something I observe by using a, a bunch of indicators, combining them, putting them in a formula, in this case Metastock, and these things just pop up. So it gives me a, a way to kind of, hey, you need to pay attention to what's the market doing. Maybe it's, there's, there's a market turn coming. Okay, this is a concept that I talked to John Bollinger about briefly at the conference back in Florida uh, last year. And I, you know, I don't like looking at um, the weekly Bollinger bands and the daily Bollinger Bands. So what I did is I tweaked the settings on one of the Bollinger Bands so I could basically have the equivalent on one chart. So this is a daily chart of the S&P 500. These outer Bollinger Bands are what they would look like on the weekly. These are the, you know, the Bollinger Bands on the daily, so I can look at it from both perspectives but on one chart. Simple concept. It's not rocket science, but it's something that I know that helps me be able to see things a little bit differently. Okay. I want to go over the, the recent market bottom that we had in, in, on March 9th and kind of look at the charts as they were appearing um, that day. And uh, just pull up the spiders because that I find that you get better candlestick patterns using the spiders in the S&P 500. And you know, what, when you got to the March 9th day here, which was not necessarily the low intraday but the closing low, you know, here we have this inverted hammer pattern, right? And the traditional candlestick analysis we tell you that you have to wait for confirmation before you buy, right? Well, let's go look at the weekly chart. Okay, here we've got the positive, we got a, on MACD, we have a positive divergence. But it's really kind of hard to tell if this is, you know, if this positive divergence is going to play out or not, right? And, and I think one of the most important concepts I learned from Connie Brown's book that I just talked about is that indicators and charts look a lot different in real time. And you need to train your brain to, to think about what they look in real time. You know, two weeks later, that divergence looked really good, didn't it? Yeah. 
But in, in real time, it's not going to look perfect, right? We just don't know. But kind of going back to our prior chart, the deal, like, hey, I got an inverted hammer. I have a potential positive divergence. Maybe I should be paying a little more attention. Well, let's go down to the 60-minute chart. OK, interesting. I, this has a 60-minute chart with uh, RSI up here and MACD here. Look, positive divergence is there. And those are a little bit more apparent. Maybe I can go ahead and buy at the close. All right, so that's just an example of how you can integrate different concepts. It's, again, it's basic you know, using multiple time frames or using multiple indicators to maybe get a different result. Okay, and that's not to be disrespectful to you know, Steve Nissen and, and how you apply candlesticks. That's just saying maybe those rules that he gave you about using confirmation, you can change. All right? Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Bart and uh, let him do his presentation there. All right. Thanks, Greg. Hear me now? Okay. First off, thanks to the MTA, Jeff. Thanks for inviting me. Um, we're gonna have fun here in the ten minutes. I promise you. So I'm gonna introduce myself, and I want the crowd to say hi, Bart. Okay? Because um, <laughs> you guys might be the only people in the world who believe what I'm gonna show you. Um, so I am a uh, intermarket musician named Bart. Hi, Bart. Thanks. And everything I learned about the market. Um, I learned in kindergarten. Uh, I use crayons. I like circles, squares, and triangles, and really that's about it. Oscillators <laughs> scare me to death. Um, I couldn't trade my way out of the stochastics default club if my life depended upon it. Um, but that's just me. Uh, I've had the distinct pleasure to train um, in their actual offices during real-time training with a lot of the speakers who are going to be here. And I'd, I'd like to recognize Connie. Thank you for your mentorship. Um, <laughs> hopefully you'll be pleased with what you see. If not, you'll yell at me like you always do. So um, let's have some fun. So I'm just about, and the other thing I learned about um, everything I learned in the stock market, I learned in kindergarten. You know that book, Everything I Learned in Life, I Learned in Kindergarten, is um, I have no opinion. I only know when I'm wrong. So. Please, let's talk about the market and everything like that, but you'll hear me say, I don't know. Um, unless I can get some sort of pattern, then I trade it, and all I know is when I'm wrong. So um, it makes life a lot easier. All right, which way is forward? This is the high in crude oil. And so today, I'm just going to talk about support and resistance. And I know it's very boring. Um, and I'm going to talk about the polarity principle. Support becomes resistance. Resistance becomes support. And I'm here to tell you, for me, um, that's all there is to it. So when we're looking at basic horizontal support becomes resistance and resistance becomes support, we always look to the past. So um, using stuff I learned in the CMT, balance, form, and proportion, what I try to do is I try to look for the key corrective move. I see that key corrective move as something that generates a wave. It could be a rock hitting water. It could me, be me smashing myself through... Uh, a bar glass in Singapore with Jeff back in the day. But basically, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to define the key corrective move. And I define that as my initial wave. I then take it, and I don't care anything that's going on over here. I look back in the past. And what I noticed by using, uh, I think that's 1.12248, which is a musical note ratio in the equal octave scale, is that the exact bottom of the arc was the exact beginning of this entire bull move. So support becomes resistance, resistance becomes support. When we get to the top of the square, it might work, it might not. But what really gets me interested in is if I continue to look in the past here, this guy held from late 2000 to, and then it blew through it till 2002. So in my world, that's two years of musical resistance and support. And then I used some basic projections. Um, we all know the 1.618 projection. What I did is I used the square root of two. Uh, I multiplied a couple numbers together. And then these little uh, yellow squares here are using the bottom in oil and taking some square roots, adding some numbers, and coming up with the level. 
So it's musical to me. So I'm an intermarket musician. So as we saw this parabolic run coming, um, I, you can see I sent it out to a couple clients and a couple people I'm trading with. And I basically said, I think that's it. Let's, let's go for it at about a buck 47 and risk a buck 50. You know, and if not, it'll probably go to 157. And the only reason is 157, if I take 2.828 square root 8, and um, the bottom's exactly at zero price. So I'm like, all right, if, it blows, if we get stopped out and lose a buck 50 for what we're trading, well, I don't know, go long or whatever, but the next target will probably be a buck 57. And that's it. If I looked at oscillators, I would just be completely blown away. And there's the top. Um, next one's United Technologies. It's the same picture as you can see. Then I th throw a little projection in there. Uh, 1.618 price projection. Throw a circle on it. Top of the circle. Bottom of the circle was important. Top of the circle might be. I don't know. And uh, bam. These are just some simple trend lines based upon some movements of things. Um, and that works pretty well. Uh, I'm, I apologize for confusing anyone. I probably should have taken them out. Um, well, I've been talking to a friend of mine whose uh, wife is managing a, three mutual funds actually out of San Francisco. And we're just talking about the market. Um, and I said, well, are you watching the Aussie Yen cross? And she's like, what does that mean? And I was just, wow, you know. So the CMTs who've gone through the program, the intermarket exposure is huge, you know. And I said, well, you're watching what's going on in the bond market. What? what? <laughs> wow, this is unbelievable. So if you overlay the Aussie Yen on top of the S&P down on a minute chart, they're exactly the same. So this um, arc, musical polarity, um, I got really interested as I saw all this stuff bouncing around in here that, you know what, if the Aussie Yen's going to hit a near-term top, perhaps the stock market might, right? The S&P might. So uh, this was a beautiful little sh uh, short at 76. And it just so happened that as this was occurring, the S&P was rallying for 66 days. The bottom's 666. Move a decimal point, there's 66 days. So the CMT was invaluable to, for everybody to look at the cross correlations that occur within the market. It, it didn't teach me about me playing music and stuff, but that's OK. Like Jeff said, there is another level that we can take this to. And uh, there's the short, down about there, or here right now. Um, and again, it's just being an intermarket musician. And, and it makes it a lot easier for me. Uh, and if you can trade off oscillators, God bless you, I can't. So I know that about myself. Here's JP Morgan. It gets a little bit deeper, but um, I really like this corrective move here. So as you can see here, this is the circle, OK? Because what my eye sees is this bouncing around in here. I want to capture that. That's going to be important. And the only way I can capture that, at least for me, the true support and resistance that occurs in the market is perhaps it's musical. So I'm using some of the more well-known Fibonacci ratios. But you can also take the equal octave scale and take the square root of one of those numbers or one over the square root of those numbers, which is the basis for the frequency of a string. What you can find is we're banging around in here. So I whip them down here to the bottom, and voila, there's the first one. Voila, there's the second one. Voila, here's the third one. So not only do you have a three drives to a bottom, what's important is <laughs> what's important is a lot of times the market respects these areas and it does the exact same pattern into them. So as I see this arc here that held it, 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 my eye became very attuned to this move right here. And it's exactly the same. So I saw it coming right down to the same point like it did by risk of buck, right? I mean, I, I don't know what, what's going to happen. And it, it was a pretty volatile move. The other thing I had going for me, um, one, of the main, one of my other main mentors, Michael Jenkins, who I've trained with, is um, you can figure out the frequency of this move by the initial impulse move down. So I had a target of about 16. And I knew four times four is 16 because I did my mathematical tables when I was you know, five years old. So um, I bought it. And there it is. So it, it's not that it necessarily works. It just helps you know when you're wrong. So um, I admit it. I'm an intermarket musician. And um, pray for me. I'll, I'll keep trying to tell people what's going on. So anyway, that's, that's how I look at the market. Thanks. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, folks, first I want to thank the MTA, and I want to thank Jeff for having me here. And um, I have an interesting background. I've been in this industry. Uh, I think this is my 19th year in financial services. I have a financial services family. My wife uh, is at J.P. Morgan Chase, and uh, she's a veteran there. And both of my daughters, before they were one month old, transmitted orders to the floor directly of the New York Stock Exchange. So as a native New Yorker, this is sort of my, uh, my life's blood, and I care about this industry, and I, and I care in particular about TA. I want to say before I get into this presentation that um, I don't necessarily follow all the rules that I'm given, in particular the instructions that um, I was given in terms of what I could present on. So I'm doing a presentation. I have one slide on the market, I'm a CMT, and my presentation is really about the opportunity for us as technicians and how we can take the great work that the MTA has already done and take it to the next level. Because I personally believe that there's an opportunity for every person sitting in this room to do something that changes financial services and really has a positive impact on our industry when it's needed the most. Of course, as a NY, uh, as a NASDAQ and FINRA member firm, everybody has to look at this. I have to leave this up on the screen long enough uh, for my compliance department to be happy. I think that was good enough. Let's talk about what's this gilded age of technical analysis? I think this is a time where the financial press is going to look at us and they're going to look at technicians and people who practice as if we're these wide sages. It's going to be a time where your stops are almost never hit, and your drawdowns and your recovery is very fast. Where fundamentalism, as we know it, and religion, and politics, and especially finance, it's going to disappear. That's the gilded age of technical analysis. I think that's the technician's dream. What are we really hoping for and talking about when we're, we're talking about this gilded age? We want to be recognized as the premier risk managers in the marketplace. There is a financial disaster that's occurred that happened, and we were still here. And what we do, I believe, if it was more widely accepted, could have had a major impact on mitigating some of the devastation that's happened to people's portfolios. And I want people to think about something. When we talk about technical analysis as a risk management tool, the world of portfolio management has impact on real people's lives. There are people with 401ks, there are pension plans out there, and that many people out there who are at a point of retirement are taking hits to their, to their 401ks and their portfolios that they can't really afford to take. So if there's a way, a capability, the ability for somebody to do something that mitigates that risk, I feel we have an obligation to step up and do what we can. Now, this is the, the one bit that I'm going to put out which has to do with our macro market view. We believe that we're in a secular bear market and that this secular bear has a different flavor and forces driving it from a demographic perspective that's going to have long-term repercussions for U.S. equities. And that outlook will remain negative for far longer than people expect. We've had a great bounce. I understand that. But nevertheless... We are now within the grips of what may turn out to be a protracted secular bear market. In that, what are the opportunities for TA? What are the possibilities for us and our ability to change the game and actively manage some of that risk? You know, the body of knowledge that we have as technicians, as is today, can service the needs of professional portfolio managers as a risk management tool. It doesn't matter if you're using musical notes. It doesn't matter if you're using classic indicators or chart patterns. The existing body of knowledge of technical analysis is a complete package that can be applied for risk management. You have all the necessary ingredients. I just listed some of the things that I like to look at and my personal favorites. This list could be very different based upon your particular skill set and how you practice TA, but 
we do have the tools today to manage portfolio risk. This is the one slide. It's very straightforward. We're looking at S&P 500 monthly. And if we take a look, it doesn't matter where you draw on this trend line. You could have drawn it multiple ways. If we use the classic definition of more than three touches, and we look at where it was broken, and we look at the decline that ensued, if this is all you had and you could bring to a portfolio manager, would this have made a difference? I think it would have made a big difference to a lot of people's portfolios. We as technicians have to ask, if this is the case, and, and I'm not trying to make technical analysis seem easy. I'm not trying to, to dismiss the hard work that we put in to get our CMTs. I'm trying to say that there's a, there's a reason and there's a compelling reason that we can go to the world now to fundamental managers today and showcase our risk management abilities and an opportunity that wasn't necessarily there in a secular bull. You know, if you can throw darts and be right, do you really need someone to tell you, all right, maybe take something off the table? Or do you need someone when it's tough, when it's a grind to get those long, long profits? You know, I think these are some of the main obstacles that we have to overcome as CMTs and technicians to get to the point where we're established and have the impact on the industry and financial services that we want and, and, and the ability to do it. And for the most part, I think that we're misunderstood. I still go to places, I still present where I'm looked at as a voodoo witch doctor. You know, maybe I use chicken bones to sort of divine the market, or I have my crystal ball to come up with some prognostication of where I think the Dow or the S&P or commodities might be going. But that's not the case. You know, last year, um, there was a lot of discussion about the real psychological underpinnings of, of, of what really runs behind the markets in technical analysis. And Professor Lowe was here, and I think the development of someone like him being in the forefront creates an opportunity for us to say, hey, you know what? We're not using chicken bones. I don't have a big crystal ball. There's real reasons why this stuff works. Um, I think one of the biggest obstacles for the broader market to accept TA comes from the fact that if you're a technical analyst, and please, Eugene, I, I apologize in advance. I commend Bloomberg for supporting TA and your role in particular. But Bloomberg ranks my cousin, who's a fundamental analyst, when he puts something across the wire. They don't rank us. We need to change that. We need to change that. The myth that market timers die broke is still quoted all the time. So if we lobby our vendors, Bloomberg, Reuters, FactSet, Dow Jones, people who are willing to distribute our research and take this and put this across the wire and say, hey, that's fine. Rank me the same way you rank the rock star fundamental guys. Let us go toe to toe. We will do a lot to dispel the myths about TA as a risk management tool. We'll do a lot to get there. Now, this slide is kind of uh, a, a little thick, but these are just some things that I wanted to suggest to the people who are in this room and suggest to the board of the MTA and to bring out as things that we can be doing to make this industry better, to leverage what we've already managed to do at the MTA and take what we've built so far and take it to the next level. Um, I just want to point out a couple of things in here that I think are um, particularly important. The MTA now has a, a role as certifying people who are going to be putting stuff across the wire and be a technical research analyst. I think if we've gotten that far where we're capable of acting in that fiduciary capability, we also have not only the right but the responsibility to start to create standards. We need to set 
objective standards for benchmarking a research analyst, and then try and go out to get other organizations like Bloomberg to accept it. So if someone puts something across the wire, how it's date stamped, how was it submitted, how were their price targets defined, how are we judging whether this was met, if we do something like this as an organization, we increase the credibility of the hard work that everybody in here does. Um, obviously, the lobbying of, of our data vendors, we all pay a lot of money for the terminals that we have on our desk. We do. We pay a lot of money for these. We should be in a position where they know what really we want and need. We have to communicate to them what we need as a tool to be successful as technicians and to bring the message of how we can manage risk out. Um, I think we need to really look at the CMT program and the core curriculum and specifically look at how that curriculum reflects technical analysis as a risk management tool. I think it's a phenomenal program. I'm proud of the program. I'm proud of my designation. I think we could make it more relevant to the industry. And by focusing on risk management and sort of incorporating that in its architecture, I think we could go ahead and make inroads in these areas. Um, I think there's also a lot of demand for certain technical skills that, that we are not emphasizing. I spoke to Tom DeMarc uh, on Tuesday night, and in our conversation, on any given day, there's 35,000 users, and, and Eugene, maybe this is, you could confirm or deny this, on Bloomberg who have DeMarc indicators on their chart. Now, the Bloomberg terminal, the majority of the people aren't retail traders. These are the professionals in the industry that we need to be able to reach. So a lot of these places are looking at that stuff. I think that's something essential that should be part of the curriculum. Um, the last thing is I think that what's really important, um, we need to establish continuing education for the CMT designation. I know for a lot of the charter holders here, the last thing you want to do is now have another reason that you have to haul your ass over to a FINRA center to go through it and sit through it again. I understand that. You know, but at the same point in time, the market changes. We need to address our competitive edge and keep building upon that. And I personally think that the body of knowledge of TA is dynamic and growing, and it doesn't hurt people You know, if it's a five-year requirement or something like that where you go through. I, I, I think that would be very important. And look, a lot of people were grandfathered when they changed the rules and required registration of technical analysts. There was grandfathering. So if there's enough pushback on that, maybe there's a way to address it for some of the folks who may not be interested. Um, then I, I, I want to bring this up for a very important point. Everybody here in this business, we all started looking at someone else's work before we started to come up with our own original ideas. You know, um, I stand on the shoulders of Ron Dano, Luigi Mata, Bob Colby, um, uh, just to name a few. And these are people who their work and the knowledge that they transmitted on we sort of have a, a role and responsibility as technicians to preserve and per, uh, uh, protect. Now, this slides in here for a reason. And uh, as a raise of hands, who thinks the answer to the question is A? B? I know a lot of people actually answered B. C is the obvious answer. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is the most widely quoted financial statistic in the world. Charles Dow gave us, as technicians, indexing. Indexing is the cornerstone of financial services. Every portfolio manager on the street is tied to a benchmark and an index. Their bonus is contingent upon it and dependent on it. Suddenly, there's 700 or 800 CMTs yet the entire world is looking at our core work and we have this disconnect that we have to overcome. Technical analysis in a way because of indexing and the concept of indexing and how it's applied to benchmarking and risk management is really the de facto standard anyway. So if the world is already familiar with technical analysis and doesn't realize that every day they're using it, 
and fundamental portfolio managers don't know they're being judged by it, we should take advantage of that and point this out to them and give uh, Charlie Dow the credit that he's really due and, and bring the role of technical analysis back into prominence, into the place that it rightly deserves. So, to wrap up, these are some suggestions of things that we can do to uh, bring this gilded age of technical analysis to um, a reality and to a fruition and to really get out there and be in front and manage risk. Volunteer at the MTA. This is your organization. Do what you can to actively support it. Mentor. Call Tom in the New York office. Be very active in your local chapter. I think demanding from your data vendor that they provide you a platform that gives you the tools that you need for success is critical. And the last thing is adopt a fundamental analyst. Find one. <laughs> Help them. <coughs> adopt one. They could use it right now. Thank you. I'm not sure. We're going to take some questions here in a moment, Al, if we can. Is it all right? I'll go back for you real quick, one, if I can make this thing work. Is this where you're looking for? One more? Yeah. Wrong way. You want to see the answers? Back. I may be going the wrong way. What are we fishing for? Oh, you. Thank you very much. Let me see the first one. Right oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the only chart he has. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, it, it's actually a very important, an, an important issue that we we should really think about. You know, um, if you participate in some of the different chat rooms out there and you monitor some of the, the communications, I personally believe that technical analysis, the house of technical analysis, is big enough for BART, a musical intermarket analysis uh, analyst, and, and Arch Crawford, and at the same time, the quants. I think our discipline is broad enough to be inclusive of these different techniques. And if we, if, if, if you fall under the category where you believe that the future direction of, of TA is solely a quant model, God bless you. That's fine. But at the same point in time, I think we as a community, as technical analysts and traders, we need to respect the fact that there are people out there who are incredibly successful who may have unorthodox methodologies that are not necessarily something we can get a handle on. It's not necessary that all technicians agree on style and methodology. It's just not. And TA is big enough to incorporate all of that. There, there's no reason why we have to, you know, I've, I've seen a trend lately where uh, because you have Renaissance capital, you know, and, and you have how well, you know, Jim Simmons is doing, and, and, and even if you look at SAC's returns, where there seems to be a, a push more towards the quantitative side of the business. Now, granted, the quants have had a good run, and, and I think there's definitely a place for mechanical system trading. I do an enormous amount of rigorous backtesting myself. But at the same time, you can't dismiss someone who does something like a trend line break. The trend line break is just a valid a means of managing risk in the marketplace as is these other methodologies. And, and, and that's what that slide really was directed at. Well, thank you. If you look in, there we go. Are we back? OK, good. These three gents broadcast them so well, I can't even tell if I'm talking. If you look in your package, there was a, uh, a letter that uh, I wrote that the staff asked me to write this. <clears throat> and the only reason I mention this is because in the first uh, paragraph, I stated that it was uh, on behalf of the board and the, and the staff, and that it was my distinct pleasure and indeed my high honor to welcome you. But I got to tell you, I consider uh, this moment in my professional career to be the utmost for me, technically speaking. 
that it is my indeed high honor to introduce uh, somebody to the stage. It's someone that uh, many of us know, the three individuals uh, on this platform. I had to keep this under wraps because they had no idea. They thought they'd just kind of get up here and run, uh, run roughshod over the organization for a little while. But uh, I had better thoughts to that. Um, this individual is the, uh, the Director of uh, Technical uh, Studies at the New York Institute of Finance and currently the uh, Chief Investment Officer at Altera. Uh, you know him to be someone who has uh, also worked at Knight, Prudential, Kidder, Peabody. He's also the 1987, the year of my college graduation, so you talk about me trying to learn to catch up, uh, the uh, MTA's annual award uh, winner. And here to call to question the thoughts and process of these three gentlemen is uh, my friend, Ralph Akinpura, please welcome Ralph to the stage. So what we're going to do for the next few moments is uh, we're going to give an opportunity, obviously, for some dialogue, but we're going to have a dynamic where I invite Paul Siena to the stage, and he's going to have some questions of the three speakers, and it's meant to be an opportunity for Ralph to take his industry knowledge and bring that to bear on three folks that are relatively new to the designation, though not necessarily new to the business, and Paul Foster that. If you have questions, please direct them uh, mostly towards uh, the three speakers, and then we'll give Ralph an opportunity, obviously, to reflect on how he might have perceived that at the time of starting the MTA and what his vision could be for, for us going forward. Paul, you're uh, welcome to take the stage in a moment, and then uh, we'll turn it over to the two of you. I didn't expect that. Jeff, I think you set me up. <laughs> I did not expect this. Yeah. You speak first? Go ahead. I'll get mic'd up. Oh, okay. Um, before we start, um, I think I speak on behalf of the senior citizens in the technical community, and I think there are a few of us here. When I say how proud I am at the MTA, and when I listen to three young men talk about um, their innovations and their dedication, uh, I'm sure Alan Shaw feels like I do. I, I was just, just quelling in my seat. Uh, just watching and listening to what you guys are doing. I think Alan said this uh, in the video, the MTA video, generations of technicians stand on the shoulders of previous giants. Well, you young men are the future giants in technical analysis, and I commend you, and I mean that sincerely. Um, Tom, wherever you are, your numbers about the growth of the MTA uh, are staggering. And I have a, an idea of what might be happening to the MTA in the next few months, because uh, we're going out and seeing other people. And I think that number of 3,000 3, members is just going to explode. And it's something that is happening with my um, year and a half at the New York Institute. By the way, I've been actually 39 years at the New York Institute of Finance, but I've been working there full time for about a year, year and a half. And financial education Financial education is a global growth industry. It is literally exploding around the world. And when people look and we talk about the CMT and its designation, the fact that it's uh, accepted by FINRA, uh, it is a big, big plus. So what you were talking about, the explosion and the interest in technical analysis, I think it's going to be global. I'm sorry, I didn't want to ramble no, on. No problem. Not a problem at all. Um, I prepared a couple questions uh, based on your presentation. I don't know if can they hear. I don't think you will. No. We good? A pro I found an extra mic. So yeah. Why don't you take mine? There we go. We good? No. Thanks, Ralph. Sorry about that. Well, I uh, sat here and I listened to everyone's presentation and I drafted up a couple of questions for everybody. Um, before I do that, I just want to give a little background on myself and where, where I am right now with the MTA. I've uh, gone through the entire CMT Institute um, with McNeil Curry and Jeff Lay um, uh, instructing it, and uh, I've passed the CMTs. I have my CMT designation. 
and now I'm working diligently as Bloomberg's application specialist in technical analysis to uh, continue to uh, increase the use of our product, to continue the growth of our product, and I tend to spend a lot of time traveling around meeting with a lot of uh, fundamentalists turned uh, technical analysts, or as Jeremy would like to say, uh, adopt a fundamental analyst. Um, that seems to be uh, a, a way to put it for me lately. Uh, no offense to any fundamentalists in the room, that's okay. But um, now I'm uh, working with Katie Stockton, who will be here a little later today to run the New York chapter. Many of you, I do recognize many of your faces, uh, as well as I'm in, now instructing the Level 1 CMT Institute um, for about two years now. We just finished the third go around. So I've uh, been working very hard with the MTA and really been enjoying it and watching it grow as we go here. Um, I'd like to get into a few questions. Uh, Craig, maybe we'll start with you since you uh, went first there. Um, you kind of touched on secrets. Now, if we're all your friends, is it really a secret? You know, uh, could you maybe let us in on one of your, <laughs> maybe one of your techniques that you that you're looking into? Maybe it's not a secret yet, but maybe it might be, or maybe it's one that got let out of the bag by someone else five years ago and. Uh, Letting it go won't hurt too much. Gotcha. Um, you know, one, one of the things I touched on, you know, I talked about some of the the prior books like the Edwards McGee, Steve Nissen, and, you know, I want to make sure no, no one takes that stuff as being critical of those books. By, by all means, those are what we build upon. But, you know, I have ADD. And by nature, people with ADD are rule breakers. So what we do is we take what people have done, and we say, okay, you know, like I said, like the confirmation of a candlestick, and we say, okay, let's see if we can make that better. I don't necessarily agree that I need confirmation to make this trade. Now, where, you know, things that I probably, what, what I view as kind of the, thing, probably some things that I work on continually are the, the multiple time frames. And you saw on the, the one chart about the Bollinger Bands kind of using what would be the equivalent of a weekly on a daily chart, so I could see that. Um, what I, so I, what I'm always trying to do is integrate as much as I can with multiple time frames to improve my timing and, and improve really the, the risk reward of any type of position that I would take. Uh, a couple other things that um, is, uh, you, you know, Connie Brown's book was really, like I said, you know, a lot of people might have liked the RSI reversals. I kind of liked her thought process. And I think you need to look at what these people have done and, and look more at their thought process and maybe their indicators. Some of her stuff led me to kind of do derivative oscillators, where you're taking an oscillator of an oscillator, um, where you're taking ratios and then doing oscillators on the ratios. Um, I do a lot of breadth work, so I'm doing you know oscillators on breadth indicators, um, and you know that's just kind of the the type of I guess work that I'm always kind of tinkering with a little bit. You know what is going to give me a little bit better edge, um, and I think that if, I don't know if that gives a little flavor of what I'm looking at. And just, you know, look, the patterns of indicators, um, with the exception of MACD and RSI, you know, I said the RSI 14 um, on that intraday chart, I don't use standard settings. And I don't, you know, there's no magic to it. It's just that I, I pick some settings that, wow, when it, you know, if I use this setting on a daily chart and it does this, you know, 90% of the time it does, and the market's going to do, it's going to react a certain way. And, and, you know, a lot of times, you know, and so I, I've kind of just, you know, played with settings till I got things that kind of made sense to me, and and visually kind of say, hey, that's a pattern I need to pay attention to, and so looking at patterns of the oscillators themselves, not looking whether they're overbought or oversold, is the oscillator showing a distinct pattern which has some correlation with projecting then the market move the next day. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Bart. Yes, sir. How you doing, buddy? Doing great. How are they doing is the real question. Mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> They're all gone. <laughs> well, I think it's past kindergarten, right? That's right. That's right. Everybody exactly. in here past kindergarten, first grade, elementary school? All right. Uh, Bart, you have a unique approach. You sent me a couple, uh, couple uh, charts from time to time. Uh, I'm usually not too sure what's going on in them. I'm not either. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. That wasn't meant to be I'm a, not either, a so. stab there. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, based on a lot of the work you're doing, I've uh, done some Google searches, Amazon searches, and mm -hmm. things to see what kind of publications are really out on it. Uh, as the quantitative approach to technical analysis continues to grow, 
Do you think the work you're doing uh, is going to be a, a, a publication uh, part of that? Or do you think your kind of work is really ready for that sort of uh, release? I have no idea. <laughs> no, I, I do okay. have an opinion. Um, the, uh, we're, all, we're all playing cops and robbers, right? We're all playing cowboys and Indians. Just picture us all here when we all go back to our same places. And I guarantee you, on Monday, when everyone sits down at their terminal, and we're all going to be shooting cowboys and Indians at each other. You know what I mean? It's hilarious <laughs> to think about, you know? And we are. And so um, before what some of us in the room, I imagine there's many people who are looking at the market the same way I am. I, I know that um, Ms. Brown is, uh, you know what I mean? Um, so it really doesn't matter if my method's accepted. What's matter is um, do I know how much I'm going to lose every time I enter a trade? That, that's it. So that's the first point. The second point is, I think it's going to be a very hard sell. Um, and the reason is because it's not about going to another technical book or another technical publication. What it's really about is going and reading probably 10 different volumes about sacred geometry. Because um, I'm entering the market based on a musical note. Well, I admit it right now. Again, remember, I'm an intermarket um, musician. And hi, Bart. You know. I'm at a meeting of all of us here. Um, I'm, I'm crazy. It's chaotic to think that oil stopped at the top of an arc. Period, dot, and a sentence. I admit it. But to the foundation of who I am, I believe that that's really what's making the market work. I can send anybody. It's Jay Bartoloni at Verizon.net. Um, I, I keep a low profile. I learned to keep a low profile. But um, I can send you some YouTube videos that show what happens to sand when musical waves are going over it. It's unbelievable. I watch that every day before I go to enter in a, a trade. And what happens is a random scattering of particles becomes shapes and forms. It's there. You know what I mean? So that's what I need. So long before another book comes out about some musical note bouncing around crude oil, people are going to have to accept that these patterns exist throughout all life forms. And the reason I say it's a hard sell is because a very um, well-known technician was down at the MTA in D.C. at a meeting, and he said, I could give a crap. He didn't say the crap, but you can see what he said. I could give a crap that the flowers on the petals go along to the Fibonacci sequence. And I'm just sitting there going, wow. That's why I'm entering the market. So I just I keep my <laughs> mouth shut now. So it's very hard. So it probably is not going to happen. It's probably going to take a full fourth effort. Um, but in the end, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. What matters is your score at the end of the game. And so really, while it's a very neat way of looking at the market, the second time I went down and trained with Connie is because I blew myself out of the market four or five years ago because mentally I, I wasn't ready to play the game. That's the real key. So we're all playing cowboys and Indians. We're all shooting you know, arrows at each other on our screens with stochastics fluttering around and our size bouncing around and musical notes and everything. But it doesn't matter if you're not mentally prepared for the game. That's what we really should pay attention to. So um, that's, that's kind of my answer. So I don't, oh, know, I really I don't like know if that, that answers uh, your question. It certainly does. I really Paul, like that Paul, comment. Can I comment on that? Sure, well, mine. You know, one thing I think it's important to note as a takeaway is for, for Bart, it's just that how he's completely doing his analysis based on what makes sense to him. Absolutely. And, you know, for, for those of you who are new in the business, I mean, I, I, and you see that for people who are just pure traders. You know, there's so many different styles, and you really got to figure out what meets, you know, fits your personality and not try to be like somebody else. I mean, I could never do Bart stuff, but, um, I, so but I, I appreciate and respect no, it. No, Craig, you're absolutely right. I had drinks last night. Um, one of them was with Michael Jenkins. and You had drinks? Absolutely. Oh. Um, really? <laughs> It was tea. It was all tea. Yeah. No, we didn't have that many. We were in bed by 10. Um, but, and another one was uh, someone who might be here. Um, but he was a, a, a big floor trader for about five years. And I've been working with him um, and trying to get him to understand there's some patterns. And, um, and finally, I looked at him. I go, you know, you, you're not trading the patterns because you think that it's the floor and you have to know what the order flow is and all those things, that this can't work. And he goes, you're right. I'm like, okay. And I'll, I'm, I'll never be able to crack his understanding of what I understand. But you got to take a look back at where I came from. I didn't even know the stock market existed up until about 2002. 
I flew jets <coughs> off of aircraft carriers. I have never taken an economics course, <laughs> really. Um, I don't have an MBA, for God's sakes, right? So I'm lucky enough that I come with no baggage. I, I come with no baggage. And so I'm e able to accept at a more easier level that this whacked out stuff that I showed you could possibly work and help me manage risk. So again, um, I believe to the core that it works. I believe to the core that everything here is musical, <coughs> that it's all vibrational energy and these patterns exist. And really, who cares if you're right or wrong because you're going to be wrong. It's how much you're willing to lose. That's it. I actually have a follow-up question that I want to ask to Ralph um, about, about Bart. Um, <laughs> Are we having fun now? This in your experience, and this, this could go for Alan as well, if Bart was presenting on musical notes to CalPERS and musical note theory to CalPERS, would he necessarily be rejected out of hand? I personally think he probably would. Absolutely. If Wrong. Bart had put the same trading results that were audited or his research across Bloomberg facts at Reuters and had a 10-year track record showing sharp drawdown and all these characteristics, how do you think he would be received when he stood in front of CalPERS? If he had to explain his process, he still would have a lot of problems. Absolutely. Because today, Alan is a little, bit, a little older than me. We still hear the same story that we heard 40, 50 years ago. The fundamentalists cannot, cannot publicly say they use technical analysis. We haven't arrived yet. We haven't arrived. The trick was to not use yeah. For instance, uh, I wouldn't uh, necessarily tell a portfolio manager to get out of Avon in 1973 because it was forming a head and shoulders top. I would merely tell them that there was evidence in my work of distribution. And, uh, and I'd show them the chart. And I'd show him how what was happening over there in that right shoulder, that it was a lower high than the head. And that meant that the distribution was possibly beginning to accelerate. And watch that support level there. But you just didn't use the words. I mean, otherwise you'd have a whole room of, uh, of, uh, of clowns, uh, so to speak. Right. Cowboys and Indians. But I can tell you, I mean, <laughs> and the other side of the coin is, is when you're right, be, ex be expect to be thrown out. Well, I was thrown out of a meeting at... Uh, at Putnam in Boston once because I told them the technology stocks looked awful and they were overweighted in technology stocks and one fellow actually took me to the door and said we don't need your services anymore. <laughs> you know, it's called don't rain on my parade. <laughs> but I went back there many times thereafter and was accepted with open arms because I was right. right. Um, and again, it's the bottom line. Um, but uh, anyway. Yeah, I, one thing I want, I want to make a, an observation. Uh, Again, being in the business 44 years and hearing this story over and over again. Uh, in fact, let me, let, me, let me add something else. Since we're all together, this is MTA. One of the first, I'll say we're, uh, it was early into the MTA. Maybe we were a year or two old. And our president was Bob Farrell. You've seen him on the screen here a couple of times. And Bob had a luncheon meeting for the MTA. And there weren't, weren't, weren't that many of us. Maybe might have been 50, 60 of us. And the speaker, I'll never forget, was Dr. James Laurie. Do you remember this? From the University of Chicago. This was MPT, the Efficient Market Hypothesis. This is 1970-71. This guy drilled us. Actually, there was nothing left. Brooksy and I, Johnny Brooks and I, two young kids, we ran up to, John, uh, to Bob Farrell, and we gave him help. He said, why'd you bring this guy here? He just, he just literally told us we were irrelevant. And I'll never forget what Farrell said. He turned around and said, fellas, I want you to experience what you will have to face in your career in this business. And he was absolutely right. Now, the corollary to that is I was in, uh, Wharton, uh, at Wharton this past March, and I heard professors talking about, gee, maybe MPT doesn't work after all. And maybe there is a problem with the efficient market hypothesis. So in my lifetime, I'm starting to see the, we're going full circle, guys. You talk about, an, uh, this is an opportunity. Right. In fact, this is what I wanted to say to you guys. How can we take that opportunity and, and not laugh at them, but to say, hey, wait, we have something else that we could 
augment MPT and the efficient market hypothesis is in trouble. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you ought to get up and cheer. I didn't make this up. Well, you've got this subject on the table this weekend going through Barron's, and I've seen this more than once. I uh, stopped and stared at this page that told me all about the ethics of the holder of a CFA charter, and I damn near threw up on the spot. <laughs> uh, I had people in the research department at Smith Barney that uh, are now in jail that had CFA after their name. Um, why doesn't CMT do something along this line um, and put ads in barons? Uh, not, not necessarily talking about our ethics, but talking about how oh, yeah. reading market entrals sometimes uh, it makes a more astute observer out of the uh, practitioner. Yeah. Well, we, uh, I, uh, I don't want to talk out of school for Tom, maybe he can speak to this, but uh, a few years ago we were advertising, and then we stopped doing that. I, I would hope that the MTA would pick up, pick up on that. Yeah, I can, I can address that a little yeah. off the side of the room. I mean, one of the things that we need to do, and we discussed this, uh, and Tom and I have many discussions, Ed has the, the board, and not to take away from uh, Larry, our pres current president who's here at the moment, but we have been working very diligently to actually prepare for what we believe to be the onslaught of interest uh, in the organization. So when you see that the, the body of knowledge, it was, except it's a poor word, but probably the closest I can come up with on the spot, that we needed to be prepared for that influx. Now, I think that actually what's happened over the course of the last 18 months in, in all markets, commodity, equity, um, uh, credit, et cetera, has actually positioned us well for that. And probably by the grace of a higher power, we are actually at the point where we're actually ahead of schedule with some of these technologies. And you're seeing some of that now. I mean, I, I remember when I first became involved in the MTA uh, at the suggestion of uh, Jim Bartoloni, believe it or not, I'd never heard of this organization. And I registered for the exam on the spot. I was actually a day, like it was like the day, and I called at the time, and the, the, the woman who some of you know was running the shop at the time, she took care of me, got me registered last second. I went to an MTA meeting. I met my partner there. Uh, this is now six, seven years ago I met, uh, met them there. And the only thing we had was basically kind of like a chat room where you can go in and kind of bat some notes around. You look at what we have now. I mean, you look inside your folder, the, the technology that's been built on the back of, uh, of the stuff that we build, and you're going to see some really cool things coming out. So when Tom speaks at 1130, you'll see the next piece of that. Yeah. It's coming. I mean, obviously, we have flow. We have yeah. bankroll. And the neat thing about this is, is with that explosion will come um, additional revenues that will make, obviously, organizational events like this uh, free of charge for us. But more importantly, what it'll do is it'll give us an opportunity to actually really broadcast the message. But we need to be in a position to receive that flow. I mean, we just can't take on a bunch of people and have nothing there because the worst thing would be to get interest and then have them lose interest because there's nothing there for them. It's incredible the amount of quantity, quality. I mean, uh, Tom went through it earlier, the list of names, and they only, they only get deeper. There's really nothing keeping us from running that thing every day, but for the fact we just don't want to dilute uh, the quality. So it'll, it'll, it'll come. <clears throat> I was going to add something. Over the years, the MTA tried to create the demand for technical analysis. That's what we tried to do. You know, we, we more and more members. And I think the demand is being created outside the MTA. We will respond to the, we have a chapter that's going to start in, in, in Greece. We have a chapter in Greece. Vasily, there he is, raise his head. He, he, maybe you should talk to him. Very excited about what's going on there. And we're going to do something in India fairly soon. India. That's talking, you're talking about thousands of people want the CMT. In Greece, they want the CMT. Am I correct? Yes. So there is a demand because of what we have created. You know, so if we advertise it a little bit more, we need an accelerator, but it's happening outside us. And I think it's what I said to you before. It's this global education, financial education in areas around the world in the emerging markets where they never had a market. And now they have a couple of market cycles, and they need. I was in India for the New York Institute of Finance, and there's huge demand there for technical analysis. So it's it's by it's naturally growing. And Ralph, when when you look at some of the materials presented today, and some of the things that they went, it covered really the full gamut. I mean, what were the thoughts at the time when you're developing the organization, or you and Alan and and the uh, 
those yeah. whose uh, shoulders we stand on today around some of the research specifics of driving that stuff out like Craig talked about or you know tweaking something just basically yeah. new thought process or pushing an envelope or as Jeremy said volunteerism I mean that's that's I can tell you personally that I have gained more from this organization than I have given and I have volunteered my tail off uh, I just it's just a very interesting dynamic the more you put into this the more you get back from it from a uh, knowledge breadth experience that sort of, but I mean, how did that roll can, out? Can I tell you, time? Jeff, the, the very beginning, you correct me, Ron, Alan, the very beginning of the MTA was getting people to sit down across a table from each other. Alan was the man at Harris Upham. Bob Farrell was the man at Merrill Lynch. They never met. They never sat down and shared. And in those days, we didn't have a, uh, an internet where you can go look up the odd lot indicator or whatever data we had. It was all in little cryptic pieces of paper in the drawers. I mean, this was family secrets. And it was the ability, the MTA, to get people just to talk. And we found that no one had the, uh, the, the, the holy grail. And once that, and then we started the network. That was the beginning of it. And what you guys are just adding onto it and doing a marvelous job. Just keep going. Keep going. And, and you'll see that program. in some of the online uh, capabilities that are coming in. And Tim LaCitra, if oh, you yeah. get an opportunity to speak with him, there are actually technologies we're enabling where we can actually not quite live share, but they're, you know, that's maturing. So yeah. the key theme is there that it's really about sharing of ideas. And that's, you know, listen, that the one thing I found is that it didn't matter over the course of my tenure of driving the, uh, the, the Institute or the organization the past few years um, until handing to McNeil. I mean, I trained over 400 people. I taught them everything that I knew. It didn't matter. Everything that I do today, it, it doesn't make a blip. We're not in our exact same time. It's not, everybody's going to make an own discretionary, probably a poor word, but their own decision as it comes forward. So it does not nothing but benefit to share in that light. So, we, Paul, I think we have probably time for one more question, and then we're going to step uh, for a short break. I think so. Uh, do you want to? Yeah, take a few leave? questions from the crowd. On the way, Bart, I want to uh, comment on that one comment where you said, uh, your analysis is like a pile of sand that falls through a grate into shapes and forms. I, I did. You said that. You okay. did. Um. <laughs> but no, you don't have to comment on it. I want to comment on that as in I think exactly what you do. If you ever wrote something right. about the type of analysis that you do, I think that's probably one of the clearest sentences that you could ever use to kind of go along with it. Sure. Uh, I just said control a, my ADD to sit down yeah. and write. <laughs> a pile of sand. Valiant. When when a pile of yeah. sand falls through a grate, it turns into shapes and forms. So not all. This, if you picture that, not all the sand uh, on top of a sewer or any kind of grate will actually fall through. You'll be left with certain shapes on top of the grate because the sand bands together and creates some sort of strength, keeping some of it above. Go right ahead. Oh um. The joke earlier about adoption. I was wondering, <laughs> does the MTA have anything for people coming in from the outside wanting to learn more where people have signed up to mentor or, or even just sit down for coffee with people, particularly people from a fundamental background who recognize Are you a the CFA? value? I am a CFA. Uh -oh. I just joined this Welcome. organization and I, uh, for about seven years out of business school, I've been following uh, oil and gas equities. And I've awesome. looked at the chart of the S&P and the XLE and oil, and I know you can't explain them by fundamentals. And so I'm trying to learn more and take a blended approach. But there's Welcome so much Pilgrim. information. We love you, man. <laughs> you search Come up. I, I can actually address that shortly. One of the things that we have also been working very hard on is trying to get our arms around how do we – foster and build out a mentoring program. And Jeanette Young, who, um, I mean, you talk about an advance for the organization, we brought her on, a, a noted technician, doing exceptionally well for herself, and she gave of herself to come and work full time for the organization. And we're building out a, mending, a mentoring program. So that's something that's happened at the moment. That's so uh, a direct. And the other thing I would say is that, you know, listen, actually the fastest growing demographic of CMTs are CFAs. If you look at it, there, Tom, what was the number? What is the total number of s dual charter, ho charter holders out of 800? It's maybe, maybe we'll call it tw maybe wag numbers here, maybe a quarter. But maybe a year ago, it was 10%. I mean, it's accelerating. Yep. So the, the blended approach uh, is definitely uh, forthcoming. 
And the last thing I would say is obviously the, the best thing to do is once you have access is, is reach out to people. I mean, I, I have had more joy in working with other folks, uh, several CFAs myself. So that's, those are some of the connectivity issues. We'll build that as we go. Uh, patience is not the word I would ask. I would just say, you know, exude vision because the board is prepared. We have a retreat every year. We're going to have another one this fall where we work very diligently on these efforts. But there's a mentoring program that's coming for this very purpose. I'm also, as the person who uh, made uh, the remark about adopting fundamentalists, let me put this out there to you. Um, I have never had a single phone call to another member and practitioner of TA turned down, not, not answered, and every single person in this organization where I sent them an email or called them directly and asked them for assistance or guidance, especially when I joined, every single one was answered. So you're, 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 you're lucky enough to join an organization where the people, I would be very surprised if you reached out to, to any of us, welcome to get, drop me a call, whatever, and reach out to the other members of this organization. It is by far the most supportive professional organization I've ever been involved with. So I think you'll have no problem finding more than enough people who... There is. A, yeah, get, through the yeah. website. With us on the break, and I'll, get, I'll show you. We'll, go, we'll get on the web right up here. Yeah. If you don't know where it is, come to me. I'll pull it up on the screen during the break, and uh, we'll show exactly where it's very easy. The final thing is see if there's a local chapter right. where you are. We're really trying to drive a lot of the um, fellowship, if you will, of technicians through the chapters. Because, you know, we get to do this once or twice a year. Um, so if, the, if you don't have a local chapter... Right. OK, oh, then great. you've got. But speaking to the general yeah, crowd, if yeah. there isn't one, start one. Yeah. I'm, your, I'm your chapter yeah. contact. Yeah. Catch me later. I'm instructor of level one CMTI. You should sign up, definitely. Start getting your hands dirty for uh, late October 2009, CMT level one. And Sherry Rossi and Emmanuel. Um, and I'm sorry, there's a few people here that were in the class as well. Um, you might want to touch base with them, too. Well, I, I just want to say, say a word. I, uh, I worked in Bob Farrell's original market analysis department from 1971 to 76, and I think this idea of adopting a fundamental analyst is a terrific one because what I did back in those days is all the fundamental analysts were not in any way interested in listening to technical analysis. But if you approach them and say, I've got an alert system, I'll tell you when the volume is going up and the relative strength in your industry is, how the industries uh, uh, go together in relative strength when it breaks down, take a look at it. And I'll tell you, we had tremendous, uh, tremendous exception. It didn't help that, it didn't hurt to have Bob Farrell, of course, running the department. But I'll tell you something, every morning in the, uh, the smartest people on Wall Street, the smartest fundamental analysts called us it was George, uh, Soros, it was uh, Larry Tisch of uh, Lowe's Corporation, the billionaire, every morning to look at the Merrill Lynch business figures to see what we, we thought about the market. What's go and there, uh, to follow up, one thing on what Ralph said, MTP, uh, MPT is being, uh, is being questioned now. And also, I don't, you know, we all know, over the last 40 years, what has been d done better, stocks or bonds? Bonds have done better if you look at the S&P 500 for, uh, against the Lehman aggregate. So people are questioning that long-term buy and hold. I think that we're, we're entering a gilded age, quite frankly, for the analyst, the technical analyst, who's able to talk to their compadres on the fundamental side and put together a money management firm. And there are a lot of hedge funds and money management firms and mutual funds and tactical asset allocation funds. That, and that's what my firm does, allocates money to these people that uh, are looking for technical analysts right now. I just wanted to say that. Thanks so much. We have time probably for one more question. Does anybody have a question for the field before we wrap up? OK, well, thanks. I, I hope you enjoyed uh, this. As always, what we're going to do is we're going to ask for everyone's feedback. Uh, we're going to roll in a few moments. So uh, I will be a gracious host, and I will give everybody a few minutes to step aside. But before we do that, uh, there are many people in the room that, that we could thank. But if you think about those who founded it, if you haven't personally thanked Ralph for starting this organization, I would encourage you to do that. There's so much that uh, goes on at the organization that goes so forward. It's so easy to forget from where we came. And if you haven't personally come up and shake this man's hand, 
uh, I really encourage you to do so and thank him for physically starting wow. this three-letter identifier, the MTA, and everything that it's going to become. Uh, it's all because two guys got together and thought to make it happen. So let's take 10. I'll call you back. Uh, be good attendees, and uh, don't punish me for letting you go. But if you want to refresh or take a little break, and then Tom Silveri will stop. And we might slip a little into lunch, uh, but we'll have a good hour of break, and then we'll have some more breaks as we go uh, into the afternoon. Thanks a lot.